Welcome. Uh, my name is Paweł Głodek and I'm Associate Professor at the uh, Faculty of Management at University of Łódź. Uh, here we uh, are about to start uh, the second part of uh, part about uh, participation and uh, the module is called Participation in the Selection of Program Content. Uh, nowadays, student, students are ever more involved in design of educational practices. Um, this is reflected in, in the growing body of educational literature about approaches uh, to students' participation, it's, uh, like design-based uh, research called DBR, DBR, uh, participation design, PD, co-creation, co-design, students' voice, student-staff partnership, students as a change other uh, agents, student engagement, or student empowerment. Um, so we can see that several conceptual models on student participation in the educational design are used. Uh, Coville and Ballet uh, developed a ladder for student uh, participation in curriculum design, uh, which, in which uh, uh, are shown eight uh, ranks of, uh, on a continuum of student participation. The most frequently, frequently used terms that related to students' participation in educational design are DVR, PD, student voice, and co-creation. The term uh, student voice is often used differently in different contexts in a more passive or at, uh, active way. Mm. So in this context meaning uh, of what it might be considered respectively uh, as a PD or co-creation. Uh, let's uh, talk about a little bit about uh, some of them. Uh, start with design-based uh, research, uh, DBR. DBR is collaboration of researchers and educational practitioners, whereby uh, they develop answers to educational problems and advance theoretical understanding. The aim of DBR is to improve both the design of the learning environment and to develop the, uh, and refine educational theories. So apart from researchers and educational practitioners, Practitioners, other stakeholders can be involved uh, in an interactive design process, such as students and educational designers. Students' role is often limited to pro provide the input. Uh, they are not put forward as the central actors within the design uh, process. Uh, another option uh, tool is participatory design. PD. Uh, PD is a collaboration of all stakeholders, including students, whereby uh, they design and develop innovations that are tailored to the learners and uh, context. The goal of PD is to uh, improve uh, quality of educational innovations by ensuring use, usability and utility of educational design for both teachers and students. Uh, starting from the idea of uh, uh, idea that all stakeholders' knowledge and expertise is highly value, valued, uh, teachers, educational uh, uh, designers, and students collaborate. So benefits of uh, participatory design uh, exist for teachers and for students in their own local practice. Uh, the implementation of new tailored made educational design. Next uh, tool is uh, called co-creation. So co-creation is close collaboration of students and teachers. So the aim is uh, to intensify active engagement of students in the edu educational uh, process and to improve teaching and learning by welcoming students' perspectives. This goes beyond only listening to the student uh, voices. The focus uh, within co-creation is on empowering students to actively collaborate within, with teachers. Uh, within co-creation, students' roles uh, range from being involved in, with limited influence on decision-making to working in a partnership with teachers. So 
partnership is uh, in this uh, context is characterized by a focus on equality between student and staff. Benefits for staff, students, and institutions include enhanced satisfaction and again and, and engagement, uh, motivation, and learning. Metacognitive skills improve quality of student-teacher interactions and development of graduate competences such as leadership skills. Here we uh, can see participation, the uh, application to, to, uh, to some models uh, and uh, some sort of uh, co uh, some sort of um, uh, interaction between uh, different uh, perspectives in the uh, right uh, down, in a corner, you can see the co-creation is uh, marked as a dark uh, green, a participatory design, design as a light green, and uh, design-based research as a, as a very light green. And it uh, uh, shows the, the uh, level of interaction between students and, uh, and teachers, and also level of involvement of uh, teachers in um, in designing uh, and uh, in a teaching process. So what is application of uh, all three elements, uh, described elements uh, to models? Uh, so uh, one of the models uh, um, made by, <clears throat> prepared by Druin uh, described four rules, students as users, testers, informants, and design partners. Uh, in DBR, students are generally users and to some extent testers, being included in the analysis and evaluation phase uh, and less in design phase. In uh, TD, students are more usually testers and informants who participate in the design and development of tailor-made innovations. In uh, co-creation, involvement of students can go up uh, to being equal stakeholders in the design process. Uh, so applying the approaches to the ladder of uh, student participation of Bobby and Bali, uh, DBR, DBR can be placed on the ladder of participation at the two bottom rungs where students evaluate rather than having a, a control of uh, curriculum. PD is situated uh, uh, at the following two rungs, providing students with some uh, choice. Finally, co-creation refer uh, refers to the upper end of the ladder, as students' participation in, is uh, on its highest level, with students having more influence on decision making. So conclusions. Uh, the similarity between DBR, PD, and co-creation is valuing the input of students as stakeholders in, uh, in the educational design process. In trying to uh, differentiate terms, key differences lie in the level of student participation in the design process and the focus on educational theory. Students being the uh, central actors increase uh, from DBR to co-creation, while the focus on educational uh, theory decreases. It's uh, it is therefore important uh, that the level of student participation is aligned with the purpose of, uh, of the approach. So next, uh, next uh, chapter is uh, about the individually tailored learning program. Uh, so uh, size uh, fits uh, all approach cannot be used for young people at risk of leaving educational early or for those who have already done so. Uh, so they need uh, individualized uh, educational responses. Uh, this refers to the content uh, of learning and the way it is delivered as well as, well as uh, any additional learning support this can help to ensure that learners are following a pathway, a pathway that suits their interests and learning styles, as well as helping to tackle any barrier they face. So, how can uh, a tailored approach can be achieved? 
individual uh, so uh, indiv uh, individualized uh, approach can be uh, achieved uh, for example through some elements like establishing individual learning or career plan plans ensuring uh, need needs based uh, based learning support uh, that is uh, support is provided uh, establishing individual health or well-being plans implementing a case management approach to students support students uh, non-educational needs uh, through mentoring or coaching and uh, it can be remembered that uh, it should be remembered that in individualized approach also relies on flexible learning pathways in order to tailor learning provision the following tips are given as a advice to policymakers and practitioners involved in the design and delivery of um, such measure. Tip uh, number one is to is develop uh, an individual learning or career plan. So uh, it's about establishing so uh, establishing an individual learning plan. Uh, which uh, outlines personalized learning objectives means that learners can be given a tailored a learning experience. Uh, the learning objectives should be clear, should be realistic, and should be measurable, so that the uh, learner understands what is required to achieve the, uh, achieve them and uh, can measure his her achievement against them. A learning plan should meet the needs of the individual in terms of both content and uh, learning styles it it could cover for example subjects to study as a part of the learning program academic support to be provided long-term goals for the student post-secondary plans and how the young person can be prepared for this similarly a career plan is a, a way for identifying uh, identifying learning uh, uh, and development that needs to be undertaken in the transition towards or uh, to working life. It may set uh, uh, it might set out a career objective as well as short term career goals and uh, identify potential bar barrier barriers to progression. Uh, an individual learning plan or career plan is formulated together with the teacher or trainer or other support staff, counselor or mentor. Tip number two, assess the individual's existing skills and knowledge base. Uh, an individual learning or career plan should be formulated based on an initial assessment of the young person's profile and existing skills and should build on this. This assessment might uh, look at, for example, the level of basic skills of the learner, prior learning and uh, work experience, as well as motivation. It should also identify an individual needs, for example, in terms of learning support. A self-assessment by the learner might form part of this process. Uh, taking this kind of holistic approach to the development of the plan and uh, basing it on uh, an in-depth individual assessment rather than providing directional guidance uh, is more likely to have a success uh, with this uh, target group. Tip number three, uh, tailor the plan to the learner. A, learner, a learning career plan should uh, take account of the learner's individual circumstances as well as his or her existing talents, competences and skills, strengths and weaknesses. It is important, for example, to take account of any basic skills that they are, uh, are lack lacking and ensure, ensure that these are tackled uh, in the early stages of the learning pathway. It should set out re re realistic learning objectives and clear goals and should also cover how the individual support needs will be addressed. For instance, uh, for young people with a high record of absence, the individual plan could address how the lost learning time will be made up. Tip number four, utilize the process to empower the learner. 
It is important that any individual plan is developed in conjunction with the student. Uh, there should be some freedom for the learner to decide what, what and how they will learn. For example, opportunities, opportunities to choose work-based options. The initial assessment can be an empowering process for the learner, helping them uh, to identify, uh, identify uh, existing skills and competences and possibly how this pertain to the uh, uh, curriculum can help to boost their uh, self-awareness, confidence and self-esteem. This is particularly important for young, young people who have uh, never achieved a formal qualification or who have been led to see themselves as a failure in a formal educational context. Tip number four, uh, five, uh, conduct regular reviews of progress against the plan. Once the plan has been agreed, ongoing support should uh, then be provided by a teacher, a trainer, mentor, career advisor, counselor, or other support person. This ongoing support means that the learning objectives can be regularly reviewed uh, to assess the progress. There should be uh, some sort of periodic opportunities to provide one-to-one -one feedback on the progress in relation to the plan, and if, and if necessary, to revise the plan in line with this uh, progress. Tip number six. Ensure uh, the learner is committed to the plan. For an uh, individual plan to succeed, it is important that the learner is committed to achieving the targets and goals set out. Uh, this commitment can be achieved in a number of ways, including through uh, a positive relationship with the staff member responsible for re reviewing the plan, as well as regular opportunities to hear feedback on their progress. Contracts can also be used as a way of setting out individual, individualized uh, learning pathway and support plan which formalizes the commitment from the learner. A contract might include, might include uh, for example, objectives for the learner, together with details of the help and support he she is entitled to receive. Uh, in may, uh, it may also refer to financial support the learner we uh, will receive whilst particip participating particip participating in the contract. Signing the contract can be a commitment uh, from the learner to meeting his her obligation. Uh, example, uh, uh, for example, a regular attendance, timely completion of uh, assignments, etc. Having the contract, uh, contract in place is, uh, set out uh, a two-way uh, agreement, outlining the expectations of the learner and the organization supporting his, him, uh, him her, uh, and can help to um, uh, ensure the learners buy in to uh, fulfilling this expectation. Tip number seven, address uh, other uh, learning support needs. It is important to ensure that in any learning support needs uh, are addressed in order to enable a learner to achieve the objective set out in his or her learning plan. Uh, these support needs could uh, relate to any learning difficulties such as dyslexia or to language needs in the case of migrant children, for example. Um, learners who are often absent uh, need to support to uh, need support to develop a plan to make uh, up uh, the lost learning time. It's, it is also so important to foresee alternatives uh, to suspension or expulsion, including on-site support with multidisciplinary teams. And uh, that was all for the previous chapter. And, and now we can start uh, the, the last chapter about providing multilingual and localized content in education in personalized uh, education. Language is a key element in a communication and of course in uh, education and education now uh, uh, process. Mm, so what is the role of uh, 
common language, which is, which is for most users, English language uh, nowadays and national languages. So in the, um, in the internet, according to visual model, more than 50% of consumers for goods from websites offering it in their language. Moreover, 72% of consumers spend all their time on websites in their language. 56 reported uh, their ability to get information in their language is more important than the price of goods and services, according to the same source. So many times content is written in, in English in the user's internet experience, but English makes up only for nearly 26% of internet users. So we might ask, uh, we might say that content, content is king, but uh, but uh, we might also ask if uh, content is king internationally. So what is multilingual content about? So multilingual content goes beyond search engine and goes directly to the user, they, uh, to the user, their culture, their habits, their trending news. Multilingual uh, means many languages, while multi multilingual content may be a strategy used to attract and engage users, students. Content to cons consumers who speak different languages. Uh, multi multilingual content relies on the ability to be able to be relevant to target audience, uh, to know their language, culture, and trending topics, and to adjust your content accordingly. So uh, multilingual content is about creating and sharing valuable content. This goes beyond translating the content and indicates uh, the process of content localization. Translating and localizing would go hand in hand for a creative multilingual content. So what is the concept of content localization? So localization, takes into account the linguistic aspects, including dialects and regional languages, and the cultural aspects, uh, such as trending news and topics and traditional uh, traditions and norms, uh, to form uh, a type of localized experience for a subset of a specific locale. Content localization means uh, applying the process of localization, of localizing to content. Uh, it doesn't really have a more, more specific definition than in putting the original culture and aspect of a, uh, aspect of a language into the translated uh, text. Content localization means the process of localizing content to serve companies that want to uh, uh, accord consumers in their own country and globally in cross-border trade. In other terms, it's a way to adapt specific content to consumers' needs. Uh, why is uh, content localization content localization important? It's not easy to directly translate uh, the the content and and courses without uh, localizing it. By using direct translation or even automatic translation. You are not only working with words, but also not, but you, but you are not working to personalize your students' entire experience. That's where companies that offer translation service come in. Uh, localizing can personalize the experience of the cons consumers with your uh, with your content by making sure that your content is suitable for a significant number of that location. So what are steps for multilingual content strategy? First step is uh, understand your own core message, 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 message. Uh, sorry. So what, is, what are steps for multilingual content strategy? First step is to understand your own core message. Understanding your own core message is uh, the first step in any content strategy. In order to transpose to others, you should have your own core message completely understood by you. So then uh, second step, 
keep it simple. Keep it, uh, keeping uh, your core content simple uh, will not be only good for your translated and locali localized content, but also good for your reliability, uh, relatability with your constant relatability. So what, uh, what are steps for a multilingual content strategy? So the first step is uh, understand your own core message. Understanding your own core message is the first step in any content strategy. Uh, in order to transpose it to, other, to others, you should have your own core message completely understood, understood by you. The second step is, is uh, uh, keep it keep it simple. So keep it uh, keeping your core content simple will not be only good for your translated and localized content, but also good for your relatability with your customers. Uh, you must be clear, relevant, and easily underst uh, understandable uh, in uh, different languages if you want to transform it in a different languages. Step number, number three is uh, create content for localization. So creating content for, for, for localization means uh, taking account of your target audience and the uh, uh, feasibility of your own core message to apply to what target uh, to, to that target uh, audience. Then you create a copy that matches uh, what you what, what you want to see, say um, to that audience uh, with your core message within. So step number four is to uh, localize and translate the message. Localization uh, sometimes take a professional help, uh, help the, the, the help uh, of professional localization experts. Leaving it up uh, to the localization team is a very a good tip uh, to, to use. So what are takeaways from, from uh, this uh, chapter? Uh, content is uh, online experience, uh, in online experiences uh, must be provided in a different languages in order to make sure that the content is tailored to those audiences. Content localization is a necessary part of the process, you know, making sure that the translated content is localized for the culture, the habits, and the attributes of your local uh, audience. International or multilingual uh, content start, uh, starts local but grows global. So that's the end of the um, webinar. Thank you for your attention. Have a nice day.